Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 18th. Our special guest today is Brittany Miller, and her topic is Intentional Learning Centers, Making the Most of Station Rotation. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will now introduce Brittany and ask her the newbie question. Okay, thanks, Lori. Um, hopefully, you can hear me okay. As a tech integrationist and a coach, I'm always on the lookout for ways to more effectively reach teachers and students. Last July, I had the pleasure of attending a free two day Future Ready Schools Institute in Albany, New York, and met an amazing team of educators are passionate about helping coaches, teachers, librarians, and administrators improve teaching. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce one of these fantastic educators, Brittany Miller. Brittany's philosophy is that in order to inspire teachers to rethink their roles in the classroom and build their capacity for student-centered learning, we first have to shake up the way we are teaching them. If we want students centered, personalized learning in our classrooms, we must first engage teachers in the types of experiences and environments that show them how. This mindset drives through work at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation, which is the research arm for the College of Education at North Carolina State University. She has spent the past six years learning with and engaging educators in schools and districts across North Carolina who are integrating digital, digital learning into their schools and classrooms. Prior to joining the team at Friday Institute, she taught 9th, 11th, 12th grade English and a young adult literature elective in a digitally enabled classroom at a high school in Wake County, North Carolina. Welcome, Brittany, and we have a newbie question to ask you. So here's our newbie question today. What is the Friday Institute, and how does it support improved teaching and learning with technology for school leaders, teachers, and students? Welcome, Brittany. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? So I'll talk a little bit about the Friday Institute. So we are the research and extension arm of the College of Education at North Carolina State University. And what we do is we, through our various different projects, we do a lot of different things. We reach out to different schools and we try to impact teaching practice, policy, different programs, providing opportunities to integrate technology. So there's a bunch of different teams that work toward our goal mission, which is to advance education through innovation in teaching, learning, and leadership. And so we have a STEM team. We have a math team. We have an evaluation team. We have a bunch of different teams. My team is called the Professional Learning and Leadership Collaborative at the Friday Institute. And what my team does is we go out to particularly North Carolina, but also uh, more national work as well, schools and districts, and work with them when they get devices in our classroom and setting up a plan, working with the teachers, and making sure that they are making meaningful choices in technology use and really starting their project with the right mindsets. And so that's really what the Friday Institute does and how we hope to support and improve teaching and learning through really interactive and engaging professional development that is innovative and a little bit different than your traditional PD. So that is what the Friday Institute does. Thanks, Brittany. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. So I will go ahead and dive in. So today I'm talking about intentional learning centers and making the most of station rotation. So I'm going to kind of walk you through um, some different ideas pulled from both my experience as a classroom teacher as well as a digital learning coach at the Friday Institute and supporting teachers in integrating blended learning ideas. Um, so if you didn't know, um, blended learning is really and essentially 
face-to-face -face methods, and you may already know this, but we'll just make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, it's the best of face-to-face -face methods in online instruction, right? So how do you take what works really well in the face-to-face -face classroom without technology and partner it with online instruction to make meaningful learning experiences for students? And that's really the goal and the hope in blended learning. And beyond that, in order to accomplish that goal, there's different models that um, schools can follow, as well as drilling it down to the classroom level. There's flipped classroom, which you probably have heard of before, where school um, students are sent home with content homework, where they are assigned videos or resources in order to learn the base content, stuff that is traditionally taught in um, direct instruction, and instead the homework part, the practice part, is done in the classroom. And so that's kind of flipped classroom. Station rotation is what we'll be diving into more today. Um, there's flex, where students can um, come in and out of the room. Labs, where they're rotating into different learning labs in a rich virtual. So, um, so a rich virtual is very specific and very different. So Enriched Virtual is actually a school that is set up for students who cannot attend traditional school schedules um, due to sports or health or whatever reason um, they cannot go to traditional schools. And so they're taking online courses, but they also want the opportunity to learn from face-to-face -face teachers. So they're forced to be online, but they don't necessarily want to be. So a rich virtual schools are very small schools. There's actually one in Raleigh, North Carolina that just got started two years ago, where students who, because of their own schedules, can't go to traditional school, come to an enriched virtual school where they're learning online um, curriculum, but they're supported by a face-to-face -face teacher when they do have the opportunity to come in. So um, absolutely. So they're a little bit different. Um, I can also give you some additional resources about the different blended learning models. And blended learning, the last three, the Flex, the Lab, and the Rich Virtual, are usually a larger school model. So it's a school that has chosen to be Flex, where students can come and go from classes, and they, they don't have traditional bell schedules. Um, lab is where they can, again, go out to maybe a learning lab where they're doing something more specific. and they can then rotate back to computer instruction and then rotate to another teacher. And so it's, a, it's very unstructured and then a rich virtual where they're learning mostly online but have the opportunity to come in. Flipped and station rotation in reverse is really more about classroom level. And so we'll be talking more about those pieces and how you can make a great impact in your classroom with those two practices. Um, but in case you were ever curious, that is what Flex Lab and Enrich Virtual looks like. But there are different models. And when you actually dive into blended learning, what's funny is we use that term all the time and almost substitute it for digital learning. But blended learning is actually a very specific model when it was originally created. It was intended to be a school-based model, which is kind of interesting. Um, but We'll go ahead and hop in and dive in a little bit more about um, station rotation. If you have any more questions about um, those different learning models, I can talk more about those as well. So we're going to be doing a little bit of busters. We're going to be doing station rotation edition of Miss Busters. I'm going to talk through some general myths around station rotation and how it integrates into the classroom um, and bust some of those myths, some of those common misconceptions or comments that I get from teachers when they're getting started with station rotation. And some of this time, some of them are from my experience as a coach where you know, the teacher may not be comfortable with starting blended learning or aren't comfortable with station rotations, um, and it just helps them kind of process that and think about it a little bit differently. So we're going to be diving into Mythbusters Station Rotation Edition. If you don't know the Mythbusters show, <laughs> that's from, I don't even know, Discovery, I think it was, I can't remember. It's an American show. Um, but I think. Hello? Sorry, <laughs> my headset disconnected. I apologize for that. Um, so the station rotation, the first myth is really that it takes more time to plan than a traditional lesson. And that is not at all the case, actually. Um, station rotations can actually save you time once you're used to planning them. The hardest part, really, is getting started. 
Um, so while station rotations, when you're learning them, do take a little bit more planning and pre-thought. When you actually start building them, they do not. Um, and they can actually come into play where you can actually plan them with lessons that you've already done before because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. A lot of the times when I'm working with teachers, and I made the same mistake as myself when I was um, a teacher myself, a lot of times we feel like we have to start over um, from the very beginning, and we really don't. There's no reason to throw out everything that has worked with us before. Instead, we can build on the things that work for us really well and do something different with them. So that's really the heart of station rotations. The number one thing that I tell teachers when they're getting started with station rotations is to take a lesson that they have planned before that has multiple pieces or multiple little activities in order to engage the students and actually break them into stations. And it's really that simple. So if I have an opener and an activity and a little bit of content that I need my students to teach, I will actually break that into stations. Now stations, ideally, should be fairly simple, right? So the heart of stations is that you really want one core learning goal or one simple activity or task that students are completing per station. The more complicated you make it, the more students are going to need your support while they're at a station. And ideally, stations are to, for the most part, self directed and so students can go to stations without needing you per se and then that allows you to facilitate more to give students more of that individual attention and so really focusing on one target goal or one simple task. So for example if I have an opener and I'm you know trying to think <laughs> what I could do. Uh, let's say that I'm teaching a simple math you know, the basics of addition. So I could have one station, and I know this is on elementary level, and it scales all the way up to high school. I was a high school teacher that did this. Um, so if I was doing the um, breaking down, I'd have an activity where they're actually working through and learning what does it mean to a add different pieces. I could have a station where they're working with different blocks and different textile kinesthetic activities, which you always want to include some station where they're doing something with their hands. Um, then they could do a little app that is reinforcing those learning goals. And so you can take those little tiny tidbits of information, little activities that reinforce the learning, and turn them into stations. So yes, it's a, it's a method of differentiation. And so it naturally differentiates for our students because they're getting what they need in a collaborative environment. While students are working together on stations, they're asking each other questions. They're figuring out if they really understand something. Because if a student doesn't understand in their group, usually the other students will help them better understand. So they're supporting each other. And I've been in station rotations where things are running beautifully and students are supporting each other and nobody really needed me. And that was a really good thing. I was wonderful um, that, you know, the students don't need me and everyone's working together and supporting each other and achieving the overall learning goal. And so then I could reach out to my students that I know may, I want to make sure that they fully understand because maybe they, um, you know, following my teacher gut, I feel like they may not understand fully. I can give them that more individual attention or check up with them a little bit more. It opens up that opportunity. And again, like uh, Peggy is catching, it is not just for elementary school. Teachers all the way through high school can do station rotations that do it very well. Um, I think it's very common and much more popular in the elementary schools. I would argue that they've been doing it a much longer time. but it does work in middle school, it works wonderfully in high school, all the way through university. If I could get a university professor as well, <laughs> that would be wonderful. But yes, station rotations are a wonderful way to keep things simple and to allow student-directed learning. Our next myth that we're going to talk about is that you can't access the work because students are working on stations. That's a comment I get sometimes from teachers. And honestly, I think that is not a myth. I think in reality, you can build informative assessment at each station, and I do this all the time. There are so many opportunities to assess your students are kind of what I call micro-assessments, where they're little tiny questions, polls, 
um, simple activities that I can use to assess my students at each station. And what benefit of actually adding the little formative assessment at each station is that it holds students accountable for the work they're doing at each station, especially for a group and you know your students. Um, if you're concerned that a group of students are not going to focus as well, <laughs> or they're more likely to get themselves off task, making sure that you build in a little form of assessment or something to hold them accountable at each station, something that they're walking away with, um, helps hold them accountable to the time. So that is one way that I keep students on task and um, make sure that I know where their learning's at. So I can take back all the assessment or even watch in real time if they're running station rotations really well, or I can actually watch them do their work. Now I have a couple little tools for you. If you are in a digitally um, enhanced classroom, um, these are some awesome tools just to check out. I'll talk briefly about them, but don't worry if you don't have technology, I'm going to talk about other strategies as well. But for micro assessments, uh, these are my favorite formative assessment tools. Um, we have Wiser Me, which is a digital um, Digital worksheet is what they call it, which I don't like that word because I don't like to do worksheets. But it's a really neat assessment tool. It's a formative assessment tool, which allows you as a teacher to ask all sorts of different kinds of questions. My problem with most um, digital tools is that they don't allow for some other opportunities. You know, you only get multiple choice or you only get short answer. Wise for Me allows you to add lists and um, draw. There's a drawing assessment tool. There are all sorts of different ways that you can ask questions as well as having a forum within your assessment too. So I am a huge fan of Wise for Me. It also has wonderful foreign language support. Um, so if you are a foreign language teacher, it has a lot of built-in support for different languages, which is wonderful. Um, Mentimeter is my second, which is a polling tool. It's very simple. It allows you to um, pull simple questions. You can do short response. You can do multiple choice, the traditional stuff. You can do scales so that they have to move the scales. Um, you can do questions where they pick a picture. Um, as well as, um, I forgot the one. Oh, uh, for you can actually have them one-word responses, and it makes a word cloud. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, so I, that's the one I use most often, is I have students or teachers think about their three top words if I'm teaching them something new. Um, for example, what is the what is good teaching? Three words, what is good teaching? And have them respond. And it pulls up a word cloud. And the more times that something is entered, the more that it is um, put in. So we have, oh, Flipgrid. I can talk quickly about Flipgrid as well. Um, so Flipgrid, I love Flipgrid. Um, it allows students to respond to discussion questions through a video. So if I had a really talkative group or if I wanted to change up the way that I'm holding discussion in my class, I can actually have them record little micro videos on Flipgrid. So that's a really neat one. Um, thank you for Terry for pointing that one out. That's a great one. Um, I haven't used it on stations yet, but that is a really great idea that you could also have a station with a fifth grade where they have to discuss. So thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful tool as well. Um, Padlet is a classic. It's been around for a while, but uh, it's one of my favorites. It's a sticky note board tool, which allows students to respond um, to discussion questions on a board. You can list different things. You can actually have students submit student work, and you can see if they submit through a link. I can actually watch the video or watch whatever they made within the Padlet itself, which is one of my favorites. Socrative is wonderful, too. That's another really good one. Um, and then GoFormative, which is very similar, actually, to Socrative. Um, more traditional forms of uh, assessment, but it allows you to actually draw on pictures. So if I was a math teacher, I could actually have students draw on a graph. Or if I, I can actually draw on top of PDF files and have them respond to questions that way. So there's actually all sorts of different types of questions. So those are some options. I like to show diverse tools that do a lot of different things. And so these are kind of my four top 
simple assessment tools, and you could have students complete a task and then reflect on it through any of these tools, and it will capture their learning as they go along. Um, for example, I did a really funny, um, what I call a micro maker. So I, I'm, you may have heard of the makerspace movement where it's allowing students to engage in kinesthetic activities where they have to make something or complete a challenge or solve a problem by actually making a physical product. Well, for many makers, I had students make a freestanding structure that allowed a pom-pom to roll on a table a specific length and then gave them different pom-pom sizes. And they had to figure out, they had to hypothesize which pom-pom size would roll the furthest based on what they know. And they was actually recorded in Mentimeter, their hypothesis and then their actual findings after they completed. But the whole activity didn't take, you know, 15 minutes, and that was actually a station. So they came around, and they had all sorts of school supplies in order to make a simple freestanding structure that allowed a pom-pom to roll. And that's, as a intro, um, a fun introduction to, I mean, you could do a bunch of different things with that. But um, we were doing more about physics. But that's just an idea, just to get things, get kids actually touching it and, you know, being kinesthetic with their learning. You don't want to give that up, even when you get tech in your class. The other one, no worries if you don't have tech. There's some other great ways, and I usually actually build these in. So, like, I'll have a couple stations with technology assessment tools, and then I'll have a couple others that are just simple responses or things without technology. For example, having them to respond to question on sticky notes, and they have to leave it at the table, giving them a writing prompt that they have to have complete by the time they go through all the stations. So that's something that you could either have at that station only or it builds on itself. Um, you could have them draw a visual of their learning at that station or draw something. Um, if they're doing math, you could have them draw, you know, something that's on a graph or graph different equations. You could have students build a physical product, like I was talking about with the mini makers, where they actually walk out. Like, you obviously know that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they're making a physical product. Um, there's also a wonderful tool. Um, well, it's more, more of a method. There's a wonderful method called written conversations, which you can, we can share that resource as well. Um, written conversations is when I have a graphic or an image or something written um, where students are given, it doesn't have to be complicated, but one sheet of information. And then um, we can actually write and have students respond to questions on a larger piece of paper around that one paper. And so, like it sounds, you write and capture the written conversations. Um, as they go. So they're building on each other. They're supposed to respond to each other with, um, I, with I like, I wonder statements, which is what I taught my students in order to um, build their understanding. I'll get the link for you in just a second. Um, so I like, I wonder, and written conversations. It's another way to kind of capture what students are doing at a specific station without without technology. And I usually do some thrown in, so there's a little bit different stuff that students are doing at different stations. Are there any questions so far? Things going okay? I'm grabbing the link real quick. Give me just a minute. So I'm going to actually give you copy of a presentation that kind of talks through written conversations, because I don't remember where the actual resource is at the moment, but I do have this. OK, here we go. Mm -hmm. I love Google presentations. They're so easy to share. Give me just a second. Grabbing the link now. There we go. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so, um, 
Written conversation is one of my favorites. You don't have to do them just as a station rotation. I just like them as a station activity. They're a wonderful way to engage students in writing and their thought process and capturing their discussions in a written form. So our next little myth is that they take more time to organize and keep organized while students work, right? So a lot of the times, um, Teachers get overwhelmed with what they feel like is a lot um, to organize and get organized. But there's actually the opposite, I feel like, is true. It's like a little pre-planning goes a long way in station organization. So there's different ways that you can actually allow students to engage in pre-planning without, um, you know, without stressing yourself out or, or overworking yourself. Because I know that, you know, Teachers are very busy, and so making things simple is the best policy. And so again, stations should be simple, and it should be an opportunity to take what works really well for you and to break it out and allow for students to engage um, in different ways and allow us to break up the classroom where not everyone is moving at the pace of the very middle of the group, but instead allowing them to actually engage in their own way and um, allowing them a little bit more time to actually do some self-exploration and collaborative learning. So one way that I help simplify and keep myself sane when planning uh, stations is I make simple little printout instructions. And now I make them with Google Slides. You can make them with whatever. But I will um, simply have a title. And then I will have, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. And you'll notice I tend to capitalize my action verbs. So like it's very important to me that every step is an action. So I always start, and it's just a thing that I got into habit <laughs> a while ago, where I will actually attach an action word, and I will start, like, what do I want my students to do? And it would be the easiest and simplest way for me to encourage them and actually get them to do what I'm hoping for them to do and accomplish at that station. And so this example that I'm showing you right now is an example of what I've done actually with a group of teachers, but they, it works really well with students too. You just have to change out the scenarios. Um, this was a station, we were doing a station annotation on the four C's, which are communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. And so those are the four C's of, you know, we all engage our students in those four skill sets, but just making them more meaningful and actually thinking them. Um, so these would be printed out, like these instructions would be printed out at each station. This is just one way, you don't have to do it. Um, and any materials that they need would be available at the table. And so like the, in this particular station, they watch yes and instructions, which is really neat if you haven't seen something like that. It's a way to encourage people to listen and to respond positively in conversation. And so in order to collaborate, right, we have to be able to listen to each other. So this is a simple activity to practice that. Um, yes and is a, it's just a, a theater trick. Um, it allows people to kind of respond and think on their feet. So what happens is they were split into teams. And so I told them to pair up, select the three game cards. And those game cards are what is below and to actually play the yes and game. And then they responded with reflections after they were done um, to the Wiser Me app. And so that was me using Wiser Me to actually break down how you how important it is to listen to each other and to respond to each other. Yeah, it's an improv game. It's one of my favorites. Uh, you're welcome to use that. But it's just a simple way to encourage people, again, to engage in productive conversation. Um, and we were doing this to break down how do we encourage students to use those skill sets. Uh, another way that um, you can make station rotation a little bit more organized is actually to move baskets or move the stations and not the children. <laughs> um, so a lot of the times the biggest problem with station rotation is that you have to, it's a lot of movement, right? Typically when you're doing station rotations, kids are up, they're moving around. Um, even if it's organized and they're shifting and it's timed out, it's still going to be a little chaotic and sometimes that controlled chaos is a little bit too much. So especially if your classroom is smaller and you've got a lot of students in your room. So 
Another way of addressing that is to move the station baskets or move the station and not the student. So if you have a classroom that's set up with tables, you can have the stations move and not the students move <laughs> and rotate. So that's just a simple trick um, to, if you don't have the space to do station rotation, you can still make it work. You just may not have to move, may not be able to move the students' bodies, um, but you may be able to move the stations themselves. So that is one simple trick, I'm glad you like it, um, to engage students and still do station rotation even if your space is limited. You can still do it. The last is being strategic about your stations. So if you are collaborative with your um, other teachers, I don't know if you have learning groups or planning teams with other grade levels or even with those in your content area, if you want to plan stations together, you can come up with little station boxes that have everything a station needs or those you know, little tubs or however you want to organize it, but you can actually come up with it together and then everyone can share those station boxes. It's another way of um, allowing it to, to simplify these station rotations is to just quite simply share. <laughs> and um, it's especially if you're limited on materials and that sort of thing, depending on what you're doing. Our next myth is that all students have to spend the assigned time at each station. So typically, station rotation is taught that they have to stand at 15 minutes, you know, at each station, and then they all rotate counterclockwise, and they all go to every station. Depending on what you're teaching, that may work really well. But you don't have to do that. You can allow students to choose which and how long they spend at each station. And so you can allow students to have choice in their learning. And it, what I like about that is it allows students to naturally dif differentiate. If they know that they need to work in a particular area, or if you need to kind of encourage them to go to a particular station and spend a little bit longer than they, you, they can. And so Station rotation doesn't have to be designed so that every single student goes to every single station for an allotted time. You can encourage them to go to every station, or you can open it up and be, we are going to be doing station rotation. You are allowed to go to any station. I'm going to encourage you to go to every station during the time allotted, but you don't have to go to every single one. So if you want to dive in deeper on one station, that's OK, as long as you're staying engaged. And what I do in order to encourage them and make sure that they are staying on task is I put up a giant timer. And I'll put a link uh, for my favorite timer, <laughs> which is called Timer Tech, because you can make it full screen. You can make it massive. Um, so you can encourage and put 20 minutes up. I'm not saying that has to be very long. You don't want it to be too long, but allow them to actually choose which station they want to go to instead of forcing every student to go at the same pace. Because the idea and the, the goal of digital learning is to be, is to allow students to differentiate, to get what they need um, when they're engaged. So you can allow some flex in your stations and allow students to choose. Now a huge part of that is teach students what they need, how they understand, how they learn, and to make decisions in their learning so that they, they have some empowerment um, is, a, is a piece to address before you allow them to voice their choice. But once they get used to it, they can do some wonderful things. So that is um, just some ideas on how you can flex students and allow them some voice and choice. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Keegan overhead timer. Yeah, any overhead timer really allows students just to stay on task. And it just encourages them because I feel, and I'm the same way. So if I have a giant timer that's ticking down, I am more likely to keep moving because I know that when the timer goes off, my time is done. <laughs> and so especially if you are kind of strict about your time usage, uh, you can encourage teach, you know, students to work faster, to get through the material faster, and to stay on task. So it's just a simple, it's just a simple posture management, you know, method. Our next myth is running a station takes more time to cover material than I could in a traditional lesson. And so a lot of times I hear from teachers that um, station rotation takes too long. 
It's like, it doesn't have to. Station rotation shouldn't actually take any more time than your traditional classroom, but you can cover more material. <laughs> so you can, you know, allowing students and turning the content over to students where they're engaging at the different stations and they're learning content at the different stations saves you so much time simply from disruptions. I, when students are doing stations, it doesn't have to interrupt everyone if a student has to use the restroom <laughs> or um, if they have a question or if they missed part of the instructions. You save all of that time because students' instructions are at the stations. And so if a student has a question, it's not interrupting the whole class, but I can give that individual student an answer to their question, or if it's a really good question, I can work with that station or add additional instructions. I've done that before where I realized that there was something not quite clear or a wonderful classroom from a student, um, you know, allowed me to kind of change just to make a tweak to a station, you can make those little moments. So that is the other idea is that it shouldn't take any more time than your traditional lessons, but it actually should allow and enable students to move their material faster because they don't have disruptions. They can dive into what they need and not just what you know, again, what the middle of the classroom needs. So in traditional instruction, we're typically trying to meet the middle and hoping that we don't lose the kids at the top or confuse the kids at the bottom. But station rotation allows us to give more individual support for the student who needs that support and allows the students that are at the top to go further, to dive in deeper. And so that um, saves you quite a lot of time. And the real value is that it's less of a difference in time spent but more a difference in the purpose and the value of time spent. Station rotation should enable you to fill those individual student needs, to ask more questions, and to have more of a feeling of how students are progressing through material because you can be the facilitator, you can be around the room and, and watch what's going on. So again, make the most of the time you have, make the most of station rotations. And so that is the very end of our presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, I just have one little but if you guys have any questions, I would love to respond to any questions. And I'll turn our slides back over to our moderators. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Brittany. I think everybody learned a great deal today. Um, I did capture one question. And as I ask, if anybody has any others, please type them in chat, and I'll ask Brittany. Uh, do, you, do you ever use a hyperdoc to start off and students choose stations to engage with rather than rotate, rotate, et cetera? So that's a wonderful idea. Uh, that's a, more of a digital form of stations. Mm -hmm. So and you could, I think that's more of like self-select and like you're choosing from a menu instead of mm -hmm. stations per se. The one value I see in stations is it does allow students to get up out of their seats um, to some degree. So, you know, it, it just getting students to walk, they've done some research, and just getting them to walk for five minutes allows them to perform better and to think and learn more. So even just simple moving from one station to another sometimes just gets them thinking a little bit deeper. So I do think there's some value there in actually getting students to physically move. But mm -hmm. hyperdocs are wonderful, and you could have students self-select from a menu and go to the different activities through that. You could absolutely do that. I have not done that yet, but I definitely want to learn more about HyperDocs. I'm still learning that tool, actually, myself. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some specific examples of how you have used stations in your teacher or administrator professional development? Well, absolutely. So I, I've used it quite a lot. I've used it to teach digital learning frameworks, where I had a station for things like TPAC, I don't know if you've heard of these before, um, SAMR, the three, the triple E. Um, those are different methods and, and different ways of thinking about digital learning. So I taught the teachers about the digital learning frameworks as well as some instructional coaches that were also there that day um, through different stations because I wanted them to dive in a little bit deeper on those different those different frameworks and actually do mm -hmm. activities around them at each station. Another one, like I was talking about earlier, I've done one about the four C's because we use right. the, 
collaboration, critical thinking at every, all the time. We use those words all the time, but what do they actually mean? What do they actually look like? And once you dive into it, people don't have the same idea of what it actually looks like and requires, and so it turns into a really interesting conversation. Um, I've done station rotations uh, on literacy practices, so we, I had a different stations about different ways that you can engage students in literacy practice and teaching the teachers how you could set that up. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can do station rotations, but those are just three examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you do station rotations every day in the classroom? I don't. I think it's all, you know, you make the decision as a teacher what is best for your students and what is mm -hmm. the best organization. I think with everything, you can overdo right. anything. Um, so I think, you know, you, you want to make that critical decision. This is a really good opportunity to break some content up and my students dive a little bit deeper into the content. And so I wouldn't do it every day. You mm -hmm. know, I would change things up, but still, you know, every once in a while to make a fun experience. For students. Okay. Are administrators reluctant to participate in hands-on learning centers or excited? I'm sorry, I was wanting to your question. Can you ask me that one more time? I forget. Sure. Me. Are administrators reluctant to participate in hands-on learning centers or excited? Uh, they're usually very excited. I've had a wonderful, you know, I, I kind of thought the same um, where I thought, you know, administrators would not get into it, but they usually do. And it's all about how you um, engage them and how you encourage them and how you talk about the purpose. And some of the stuff that I've shared with you today is some of the stuff I do to set them up. And then we debrief afterwards. But if you have opportunities where there are kinesthetic activities and things that they can do and learn and dive into, regardless of who they are, People like to learn by doing, and so mm -hmm. I've had no problem with administrators or, you know, principals tend to love it. They tend to dive in, and I, I also tend to work with a very diverse group. I'll have teachers and admins and coaches all in the same PD. So they, the principals usually come up to me and thank them because, or thank me because they don't get a lot of opportunity to just be themselves with their teachers and to learn with them. Uh, so. I've, I've had no problems with administrators. Terrific. Those were the questions that I caught, except the ones that you did as we went along. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions for Brittany? I have one. They're asking about a web whiteboard. Um, mm -hmm. This is another good one for someone for who was asking it. The web whiteboard is one of my favorites, but there's also this one. <laughs> okay. Again, thanks very much. I'm now going to turn the show over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to meet everyone. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was terrific, and it's so memorable because all of us have heard those myths, maybe even had them ourselves one time or another, and I love all of the suggestions you've given us because we can use them as responses to other teachers and administrators who may have some of those same myths. So thank you all for coming today. We have a show almost every Saturday, but next week is an exception. We are celebrating Thanksgiving in the United States, and I know many of you are not in the United States, but we'll be taking a break next Saturday. But then we have some fantastic shows coming up. I'm so excited about them. December 2nd, Stephen Anderson who I think is also from North Carolina, is going to be doing accessible digital content for everyone. And then on December 9th, the amazing Shannon Miller, librarian extraordinary, is going to be sharing all about Buncee and Edubuncee. 
December 16th, we have a fabulous show with Carly Mora and Sean Fahey on Flipgrid. And I just know they're going to be integrating some HyperDoc things with that, too. So that will be a great show. Then we'll take a winter break. All of us have so many things going on in our lives around that time that we'll be off from December 23rd through January 6th. So mark your calendars and plan to come back on January 13th because we're going to have a really fun party show. And it's going to be the celebration of our ninth anniversary. We have been doing these webinars for nine years. And we think that's worth celebrating. So plan on joining us on January 13th if you can. And you know you can always catch these things in the recordings if the time doesn't work out for you, but thank you so much for joining us every week. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session, and as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or from within the live binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month as well. The video collections on iTunes U, and again, you can access this from within the live binder. As you exit the session, the survey should open up. Here's the direct link, or you can take the link from the chat or from within the live binder. And when you do take the survey at the bottom. You can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out with your name, thanks to Patty Rothing, and thanks to Patty for sending these out. Uh, please, though, if you request your certificate, make sure you use a personal email address and not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Brittany Miller, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>